Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Why don't we have our other panelists coming up? Lu Fang, Yao Yang. Zhu Gao, there we go. Great. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Hello, Nurchin. Meeting all these individuals <coughs> for the first time. This will be great. Um, China's economy in 2016 and beyond. Uh, considering what we have seen in the markets in the last couple of days since the start of the year, this is an incredible uh, opportune time to talk about this, and it's great to be on the panel. We're going to start with um, five minutes worth of introductory remarks from each of the individuals here, and then we will uh, have a discussion and also take questions from the audience. So, um, Lu Fang, why don't we start with you? Uh, labor markets in the period of China's okay. economic? Slides? Sure, yeah. slides would be great. Okay. And we're trying to keep it to five minutes, so if you go long, I'll probably signal. Okay, okay. okay. That's okay. <laughs> but, uh, I expect it to be eight or ten minutes. But right, I'm I saying five because I assume you'll go eight. And I'm worried that you'll go eight and then go 15. So. Because <laughs> now you are in the control. Okay. So, yeah, I would like to share my observation on the overall macro e economy and the policy with the special emphasis, uh, emphasis on the labor market uh, and uh, development, okay? So China's economy has experienced uh, four times downturn adjustments in its post-reform era and is now at the trough of the adjustments of, the, of its cyclical and structural transformations, okay? But it is a very a puzzled observation. Though the economy has been slowing down, the em employment rates are relatively stable in recent years. So it is at odds with the open law in the ACOM 101 that states that changes of the unemployment rates should be inversely related to the economic growth rate significantly. So, but actually, so in my observation, since China is undergoing rapid growth of creation of non-farming jobs through migration of the rural laborers, changes of the migrated workers rather than unemployment rates are more responsive to macro cyclical uh, changes. So the aug augmented open law may be designed to incorporate two variables of unemployment rates and the growth of uh, migrated workers captured the effects of the macro uh, cyclical changes. Then you can see if we're using this kind of understanding as a model to estimate the uh, equation using the empirical data of China, then you can, we, you can find the significant relationships between the macroeconomic growth on one hand and uh, uh, migrated workers change on the other hand. Okay, then you can, on the basis of this, you can have sort of the China's empirical open law curve. That highlights two points. Number one, labor market did respond to macroeconomic changes reflected by the positive slope of the open curve for China. Number two, China's potential growth rates may have fallen to less than 8% from the previous two digit figures reflected by down shift of the open curve. That is one of the points I want to make. You know, Actually, we are puzzled about the observation of the inconsistency of the employment uh, rates on the one hand and the growth rates of the macroeconomy on the other hand. But actually, in my understanding, my understanding, uh, the data are consistent. If you look in, if you take into account of the special context of the labor market in China as a, uh, as a transitional economy. So, in the following slides, I would like to go very quickly because uh, the time is running out, okay. So generally speaking, because the em employment is still relatively good, so income growth is still relatively robust. On the other hand, consumption is still relatively stable. So I, would like, I, I don't want to go to detail for that. Uh, I go through the slides very quickly. One point I want to highlight, why the total employment is still growing quite rapidly uh, um, in recent years. Uh, one of the main contributor uh, factor is uh, the, the, the surface sector. Tertiary sectors contributed to, to, to the creation of the non-farming jobs over the last four years also by 8%. Okay, then the income growth is quite good. Salary 
for the migrated workers are still growing very strongly. So as a result, income growth has been quite, quite rapidly consumption, household consumption, even though, you know, and the official consumption, you know, and the luxury consumption, especially by the, by the, by the officials has been collapsed, collapsed but uh, household consumption has been still growing very rap rapidly. So finally, uh, a few words about the recent development of the policy, okay? So the Central Committee of the 18th Congress of CPC held its uh, fifth plenary session in the late October last year. So my agenda is examination of the suggestions on the 13th five years plan. The key words of the plan, the new plan is completing of the goal of the building of the Xiao Khan, a moderately prosperous society in all respects, okay? So how to achieve Xiao Khan? There are five core tasks or major policy agendas. Number one, the innovation in many aspects. Number two, harmonization. Number three, green strategy. Number four, opening up. Number five, sharing, okay, mutual sharing, okay, strategy. Uh, but after that, the policy has been uh, laid out for the this year's priority working principles. So the policy has been defined in recent events, uh, high-level events, you know, to uh, deliberately elaborate the uh, very consistent and uh, robust and very clear and the principle for this year in terms of the working um, principle. So generally speaking, uh, the wide total demand should, will be expanded appropriately. Priority of the policy, uh, economic policy, will be given to supply side structural reforms with focus on five areas. Number one, dealing with overcapacity using market clearing mechanism. Number two, reducing firms' costs through three or five combined measures. Number three, reducing inventories in housing sector through pushing forward urbanization. Finally, number four, enhancing flexibility and efficiency of the supply system. Finally, preventing and uh, absorbing financial risks. So in summary, I think China's economy is still in the trough of the due adjustments. But, unfort but fortunately, the situation of the employment income and consumption growth are relatively stable. So China will continue to boost the growth in this year, but policy focus will be given, shifted to the structural reform on supply side, on supply side economy, dealing with the overcapacity, excessive inventory and leveraging, mainly using market mechanism. Hopefully, successful completion of the due adjustments may pave the way for China to enter into another booming period during which China may have chance to become a high income country. I hope I'm still in the budget of time. Five, five minutes, I am Thank astounded. You. Good. <laughs> Could you show me the very first slide again? Can okay. you go back? Sure, sure, no problem. The, on the growth rates? Oh, I, I just I wanna know. see I, what I you're- I don't know how to do that, you know. Yeah, going forward, I, I we always go forward. I only can do one, one, one way. <laughs> don't worry about <laughs> it, we'll, we'll do another one. We'll, we'll, don't worry about it, we can, okay. we can figure it out later. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. Um, do you have a uh, slide? Or you just no, let okay. me just, just speak sure. along here. Okay. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, uh, some uh, bad misunderstandings about the Chinese economy, in my opinion. Uh, the first one actually uh, has already been dealt with uh, Professor Lin. Uh, I, I agree with him. Uh, the Chinese slowdown is mainly cyclical than uh, structural. Um, but then I, I'm going to talk about uh, three things. Uh, the first uh, is uh, about uh, the reform and the growth. Uh, many people believe that China can tolerate a low growth rate uh, because uh, China wants to reform its uh, economy. And then we can sacrifice uh, uh, ref uh, uh, growth for that. Um, but uh, if uh, we look at uh, the thir uh, 13th five-year plan, the gross target is 6.56% on average. Is that uh, a very easy t uh, target? Uh, uh, doing some international comparison with terrorists, and that's not easy, okay? Let's think about Japan. Japan reached the China's current per capita income in about the 1970, okay? Uh, before that, uh, Japan maintained a growth rate uh, 
more than 9% for 20 years. But uh, after that, uh, in the next 20 years, Japan only managed to grow by 3.5%. Don't, don't mistake uh, about that. Uh, Japan was a high-performing economy in that period of time, right? Almost uh, every major innovation came out of Japan in the 1970s and 80s. But Japan only uh, be able to maintain 3.5% growth rate. Right, so that's a question mark on China, whether China can maintain 6.5 growth in the next five years, uh, uh, not to mention the next 20 years. Um, but 6.5 is a hard target. We have to meet it. Uh, no doubt about it. That's a political task. It's not something that uh, you can just miss about. Okay. Uh, so growth is uh, still very important. Uh, uh, and I believe that uh, the top Chinese leaders know this. Okay. And then second misunderstanding is that um, China can boost the growth by doing supply-side reform. I'm not saying that supply-side reform is not important. Uh, uh, they are important for long-term economic growth to sustain China's potential growth rate. But if we believe that uh, China is now in a cyclical downturn, okay, uh, then probably the demand side is more important. Right? There's a huge uh, uh, output gap uh, in China. Um, my own calculation shows I, I'm not as bullish as uh, Professor Lin, uh, but the still 7%, the potential growth rate, uh, uh, is uh, either China's uh, 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 potential growth rate in the next uh, 5 to 10 years. Right? So with that, then there is an uh, output gap over there. And then uh, there is a clear lack of demand in China, not because of lack of supply. Okay. Then come down to the third misunderstanding that there is uh, uh, the Chinese economy o is overly leveraged, right? Uh, Xu Gao probably is going to deal with uh, the corporate sector. But let me uh, say something about uh, the government sector, okay? Uh, is the government sector overly uh, leveraged in China? If you look at the, uh, the, the data, uh, it seems like so, right? Uh, uh, local governments are heavily indebted. Uh, the uh, central government uh, deficit is about 2% of GDP, right? Uh, so it depends on how you calculate it. 60%, uh, some people say 150%. Uh, but you have to realize most of China's uh, government debts have been spent on infrastructure, not on consumption. You know, which means uh, we do not have a future liability. It's not like in developed countries, right? Uh, the spending is because of future liability, right? Um, so that's quite different. And also, those uh, infrastructure investment has produced uh, something, right? There is a return. Actually, there's a huge return to infrastructure investment. We cannot just uh, look at the economic returns. The same with the high speed rail. It just uh, changed people's notion of geography in China, right? There's a huge gain over there. Okay. Uh, see, the, the, if uh, we look at, uh, uh, we, if we use a broader definition of government spending, guess what? In the last uh, several years, the Chinese government physical spending is uh, contracting. It's not expanding, okay? Uh, government uh, saving uh, has uh, increased uh, from 10 trillion yuan to 21 trillion yuan from 2011 to September 2015. That's uh, 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 Hydro's uh, colleague, uh, Liang Hong's figure, and most people agree with that. Uh, so the whole government spending is contracting. It's uh, interesting, right? Uh, the Chinese economy is coming down, but the government is spending less and less. Doesn't make any sense right? uh, when you have uh, a contracting economy. So with that, uh, I believe the Chinese government should do more physical expansion. Uh, one example, uh, is to issue debts, then the government used the money raised from debts to buy those uh, excessive supply of housing. I mean, the, the, the total excessive supply needs seven years uh, to digest uh, without uh, uh, new uh, uh, buildup uh, in the economy, right? So if we, the government can do this, uh, then uh, number one, we can reduce the inventory in the real estate uh, sector. Number two, we can deleverage the whole real estate uh, sector. And number three, we are going to boost uh, consumption. And of course, 
uh, we are going to improve the welfare of those poor people. I mean, poor people are not going to be able to buy those houses uh, built uh, in the city, right? So relying on the hope that uh, urbanization is going to drive up uh, China's consumption of housing, that's uh, probably just a wishful thinking. We need the government to do more. And uh, uh, this year will be a difficult uh, year for China's economy. And uh, uh, if the government uh, uh, does not act uh, uh, more actively, uh, there are high risks. That's all. Thank you so much. All right. The next topic is why, you hinted at this, why does China need more debt? And Xu Gao is getting up here, so I assume there's slides. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Well, when you look at the title of my s presentation, you may be wondering that, uh, what does he going to say? Because isn't this, a lot of people think, uh, isn't the case that China has built too much debt and um, are facing substantial risk of a debt crisis? Well, I certainly don't share that view. Well, as, please put my, uh, slide on this on the on the projector. Well, I think that China still have uh, has ample room to increase its leverage, and uh, moreover, I think China should do that uh, uh, in order to maintain a stable economic growth. So, in my views, and uh, a debt crisis in the foreseeable future, the probability of a debt crisis is is low. Okay. Oh. Well. Where is going on? Huh? Green one. Oh, all oh, right. Okay. Oh, per perfect. Okay, let me s first show you some chart. And uh, this is a uh, debt data compiled by China Academy of Social Science. As you can see in the right, in the left one, and uh, it is true that uh, the debt, the total debt as a GDP, as a percent of GDP, has been continuing increasing in recent years, and. Uh, especially in the non-financial corporate sector. And because the, much of the debt are backed by uh, bank lending, so the outstanding bank lending as a percent of GDP also, in, also has increased uh, significantly, re especially in recent several years. And I'm going to show you an um, even more horrifying chart. Well, you know that uh, a lot of infrastructure investment in, in China uh, Taken or uh, under well, well undertaken by the so-called local government financing vehicles, and uh, we calculate their uh, financial data. So the dark line in this chart represents their average return on assets uh, of this uh, thousands of uh, LGFVs, less than three percent. And look at their funding costs. Well, their average yield, average yield of their bonds, uh, is more than six percent, and the average bank lending rate about seven percent. So they're borrowing money at the six to seven percent to finance investment projects that can that have rate of return less than three percent. So to many people, this looks like a Ponzi game. That's why a lot of people think that China will eventually, inevitably, have a debt crisis in uh, in the future. But I think to give a full picture of a debt sustainability, it is not only we should uh, we should not only look at the debt itself, but also look at uh, the assets. So let's look at the debt to as a ratio in China's various sectors. Well, you can see that the, the debt to asset ratio remain, remains stable in the past several years. And a lot of people worry about the China's government debt, but government debt to government uh, as a share of government assets is less than 40%. So if you look at debt to asset ratio, it just looks very healthy. We don't, we don't see any uh, meaningful pickup in any time in, in, the, in, in the recent years. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of country uh, have so-called balanced pay payment crisis because they bought too much foreign debt. But if you, according to the IIP data, China now still has about two trillion US dollar net foreign assets. Well, so the balance of payment of China is very healthy. So if you look at the asset side, there, you shouldn't worry about the debt crisis. And uh, in order to have a full understanding of the debt sustainability, you should also, you should also look at the, the behavior of the creditors. Because we had debtor, at the meantime, we should have uh, creditors. And creditors are savers. We should study their behavior. A lot of people, you know, that uh, it is quite different from other Western countries, from Western countries. 
is that China's corporate sector is in a separated savers because China's corporate sector doesn't distribute its profit to household. This is the data from the flow of funds uh, table of China. As you can see in this chart, uh, China's corporate sector has a lot of money, has a lot of profits, but they just basically distribute little to the corporate, to the households. And let me give you another interesting chart. This is the international comparison of savings. You know, the national savings comes from two main sources, the corporate savings and household savings. The corporate savings is just the undistributed profits of corporate sectors. And if you look at the uh, light purple dots in this chart, that represents the wealthiest countries. And you can see a clearly negative correlation between savings of non-financial enterprises and savings of household. Why? Because if you learn economics, you know that uh, savings of corporate sector is just another form of household saving as long as the corporate sector is owned by the household sector. That's what's so-called the uh, appearance in the corporate veil. But it is definitely not the case in China. As you can see in this chart, China stands out because China has a lot of corporate saving as long as well as a lot of household saving. Why is that case? Because over 50% of Chinese corporate sector are state enterprises. And SOEs, they are kind of strange savers. This kind of saver, they don't consume. They just save. So that's the why China has so much debt, because we have a kind of strange saver that never consume, that always save. So if you look at the forecasts, well, this is the forecast made by the IMF. China will continue to have massive savings. And China's saving now makes, is much more, much bigger than savings in other countries. If there is no more debt in China, who can balance China's savings? So I think we should think about seriously what Keynesian said, the paradox of seed. If there's no more debt in China, I think that is not only bad for the Chinese economy, but all also a bad news for the world economy. Thank you. Got it. Great. Thanks so much. That was terrific. Um, if I could bring it, so you've all had these great presentations about big themes for the Chinese economy. If we could, my first question, if we can make it a little more immediate because we've seen this massive selling going on in the Chinese stock market, the subsequent selling here in the United States as a result. I should tell you, just as we were sitting here, the Chinese government announced that they were going to suspend the circuit breakers in the stock market and just eliminate them, I believe. I haven't seen a full write-through yet. Um, so things are changing very rapidly there. What do you think is the state of the Chinese economy right now? If you were going to slice this quarter right here, it's growing at what, do you think? Any ideas? Sure, jump ball, so, as we say. For which, which <laughs> stage? I think uh, we have discussed this issue in, 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 in May and the presentation already. So number one, I think uh, there's a consensus. After very rapid growth, almost 10% uh, each year, over the last uh, 30 years, uh, more than 30, something like uh, 36 years, now China has entered into a phase uh, which were can sustain so-called high and middle level income, uh, the growth rate. So in other words, around something like 7%, you know, and a good time, maybe more than 7%, but bad time, you know, maybe and lower than 7%. So that, that is one of the dimension you can look at China uh, the, the general pattern. You so think, the, you the think the right now it's still rate. growing 7% no, at the no, moment? No, no, no. no. The second, I mean, the number one is okay. a trend change. Okay. Number two, I think it's cyclical. Okay. Even there's a different, uh, maybe slightly different perspective by okay, our colleagues, but generally speaking, everybody agree. Now China in the trough of the cyclical adjustment. So when you're cyclical downward adjustment periods, usually your, your growth periods, uh, your growth rate is lower than you know, your, 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 your 
your potential uh, growth rate may be slow to, uh, uh, lower than 7%. Is it possible? Okay, it's not, uh, not high enough. Finally, I think uh, now uh, I mentioned that because this year uh, the Chinese government have made their mind to have very bold structural reform agenda. Okay, they announced uh, recently. So in other words, generally speaking, the context is that because we are in the cyclical uh, downward adjustment periods, there are a lot of problems accumulated in the past. For example, overcapacity, uh, a lot of over inventories in the housing sector, okay, and uh, extreme high burden for the firms. So it seems to me, as an observer, the policy makers in China want to determine to make some bold uh, structural reform measures to address these issues. So to address the issue, to address these problems through market mechanism, maybe that can produce some impact which are favorable of growth rate, but on the other hand, may also hang on the short-term growth, okay, to even lower and the growth rate. So at the margin, I think this year, the growth rate may be even lower, you know, it's possible. But hopefully, you know, we can still uh, achieve uh, the growth rate of 6.5% highlighted by Professor Justin Wynn. So in summary, we, we need to look at the economy from different perspectives. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I tend to agree with Wu Feng that uh, China is now in a transition period. They, I also want to emphasize, you know, uh, like she got just said, uh, we have saved so much in the last uh, two decades. Right? It, this is uh, uh, everywhere in those uh, high-performing export-led uh, economies, right? We all have all saved quite a lot. And now is the time for us uh, to transform those savings. It's going to be nominal wealth into real wealth, right? Uh, you, have, you have several ways to do that, uh, but the most important way, I think, right, uh, is uh, to make the investment so you can have a future income stream into the future, right? Uh, another way, of course, in, uh, like just uh, like in Japan, you just uh, invest uh, in other countries. But I don't think that that's going to be good uh, for the long-term uh, development in China. Right. Uh, so I, I tend to agree with Shigo that uh, we need uh, to raise more debts uh, in, in China. Right. In w one way, that is uh, we are doing this kind of intergenerational transfers. We ask our future generations uh, to transfer some of the wealth to us. Uh, but that's uh, reasonable because uh, our future generations uh, are going to be born uh, with a golden spoon in the mouth. Right? So that's a kind of a generational mm -hmm. uh, fairness. Have, have you modeled out, uh, so you, you would encourage the Chinese government to do more fiscal stimulus. If you stick with status quo, China will grow at X. And if the Chinese government were to do what you think it should do, it would grow at X plus what? what what's the differential? Uh, I have never done this kind of a calculation. Modeling, that's, okay. a, that, that's a tough question. But <laughs> OK, that's fine. I was just curious. Mm. All right. Well, um, so going back to the wh how what is the state of China's growth right now, do you think, Zhu Gao? I mean, we have, we have people who come on my network and say, it's approaching zero mm -hmm. for a growth mm -hmm. rate of China. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the most uh, dangerous thing for China is the fear itself. Well, the more the fear of the debt, the more debt problem you got. You know that as long as China has stable economic growth, that everything will be okay. But if there is a sh hard landing, well, when we enter the phase of a massive decapitalization, massive layoff, well, I think economic growth is not a, is not, will not be concerned. Because next, at that time, what we should worry about is the social stability. So I think as long as China has some, some kind of uh, unique structure, has this uh, separation of the corporate sector and the household sector, and a lot of savings provided by the corporate sector, I think it, it, is, it, should, be the case, it should be the case that China can use this saving to boost its economic growth as long as it wants. So I think. The f what the phase the Chinese economy now uh, is in it is crucially depend on the policy orientation. So if you use some austerity measures 
to control the growth of the debt, and uh, if you look at the international experience, the result will be you, have, you will have a bigger and bigger debt because the economic growth will shrink to, I think, not zero. I think the negative will, will fall to the negative territory. But as long as you use debt to, 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 to maintain a stable economic growth, I think it, there is no di little difficulty to maintain a stable economic growth above 6.5% in the next five years and in the next 10 years. Since you're with Everbright Securities, I want to ask you, what, what do you think of what's been happening for the last week well, in the Chinese <laughs> market? And, and, the, and, and how should we think about the Chinese government's decisions some days to intervene and, and prohibit selling by, by large shareholders and then mm -hmm. putting in circuit breakers and removing them? Well, you know, that uh, I got news that the, the uh, circuit breaker has, has been suspended. But I think it's unfair to blame the circuit breaker to, for the tumbling of the stock share, uh, the stock price in the past several days. Because I think the main concern of the investors globally are the depreciation of the RMB exchange rate. Because it looks like at the, the PBOC is a fighting losing battle at the exchange rate market. At the, because the more depreciation of the RMB exchange rate, the stronger depreciation expectations in the market. And the, it, that is what is going on in the market. We see a kind of vicious cycles in that. That's really, that's what thing really scares investors. So I think the circuit breaker, I think it's, it's just a, a technical mechanism and should have not uh, impact on the trend of the stock prices. And uh, come back to the stock market, because you know that the stock market is still in a kind of uh, unnormal phase because in the, in June and July of last year, we have a, a huge volatility in the market, and now the market is still under a great influence of the government. And uh, because uh, the valuation of the stock price is still very high, so I think that uh, there is a possibility that the large fluctuations will happen, not in past days, but in the future. So I think it is, uh, in order to maintain a stable market, I think it is uh, business usual for the government to intervene. Uh, when situation uh, becomes uh, extreme, and especially when we see there are signs of vicious cycles are taking place in the market. Do, do either one of you have an opinion on, on the situation with the stock market or how we should think about the way the, the government is thinking uh, in terms of intervening within the stock markets? Oh, uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but in general, I think. Uh, uh, China needs to develop a much deeper capital market. Uh, the problem is that uh, we only have, you know, people only have the stock market to invest in, but we have so much saving in a society. We have to find a way to spend our money, to invest our money, right? So that's why creating kind of more debts in the hands of the government, that's going to be good, right? So people are going to buy those debts, right? Then we are going to make uh, our nominal wealth, uh, it's kind of real wealth uh, in the future. Right? Uh, so that's, uh, to me, that's the ultimate solution to this problem. Vang, no, and no? No, 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 further no, no further comments. Okay, um, I'd like to take questions from the audience at some point, so let's get the um, microphone, somebody can raise their hand, um, and if nobody wants, oh, here, here we go, we have one right here. And this, why don't you raise your hand again? Can you introduce yourself, what you do? Uh, my name is Sun Yu um, from Biologic. Uh, I have a question for uh, Professor Yao. Uh, we met about five years ago when you and uh, uh, Professor Lin and uh, Dr. Qin were in New York. And we, uh, if you remember, we were at the dinner table. We sit next to each other. And we had some discussions about uh, the Chinese uh, one-child policy. And uh, you, know, you were mm -hmm. strongly against that. And, uh, uh, you know, in relate to that, we were uh, discussing about the, the comparison between India and China economy. So fast forward five years, and now the one China one child policy is gone, and uh, you know it approves that what you are predicting. But now the question for you now is: Is it already too late? You know, be, when this generation, this baby booming, if it happens, when they become into the labor, it's gonna be you know, 20 years from now. Is that gonna be too late to be a big factor of 
you know, to correct the, the, the problem that has caused in the, in the last, you know, two decades in China? And also, can you predict uh, in between China and India, what's your view of the, the economies in these two countries in the next uh, 10, 20 years? Thank you. Uh, y yeah, I believe, uh, not I believe, I think uh, most of demographers uh, tend to believe uh, this policy came too late. Uh, probably the right time was the early 1990s, right? Uh, today, uh, even if uh, we allow people to have two children, I don't think many of them choose to have two children. It's just uh, too late. Um, it's not going to have a huge impact uh, on the Chinese economy in the long run. Probably in the short run, we're going to have more babies. Uh, we are going to have more consumption in the short run. But that's uh, going to be just a one-time adjustment. It's not going to have a long-term impact. Uh, thinking about uh, India and China in terms of uh, demographic structure, uh, we are going to, uh, uh, last year India's growth rate was higher than China's. Uh, we are going probably we are going to see this uh, in the coming future. Uh, uh, this is just a natural thing. Right? Lefang, did you want to weigh in on there? Since you spoke about the labor markets and the the question really relates to whether or not the the change in policy can offset the the decline in age and, and the reduction in the size of the labor pool that's available because of the aging society. Yeah, you're correct. Actually, these two things come together, you know, in some uh, sense. But uh, if you look at the labor market at the moment, one structural change is that, you know, the, how can I say, the age, the labor, the working age population has approached to zero, okay? So, in future, you know, because of the second child policy reform, may have some difference in the trend change in many years to come, but uh, surely it will not, not have some immediate impact, you know, in the near future. Why, why do you think people don't want to have more than one baby now that they can? It's so <laughs> expensive. It's expensive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that simple, yeah, got yeah. it. Question here. Thank you, uh, Earl Carr, representing Momentum Advisors. I I'd be curious to know, there's been a lot of talk of the Trans-Pacific um, Trade Partnership here in the United States. Um, how does the Chinese government view TPP? And do you see, given the, the volatility in the Chinese market as of late, how do you see that putting pressure on China to potentially join TPP? Uh, currently, there are 12 nations that are have agreed to this um, consortium. However, there's, there's questions whether or not this, this agreement would actually get completed, but would be curious to know um, the significance of this agreement. Yeah, sure. Like, uh, um, I, I think in general, China uh, has not uh, prepared well to join TPP. TPP is not just about uh, a trade agreement. It's actually not about trade. It's about uh, behind the border uh, regulations, right? It's going to unify the regulation uh, uh, among those member countries. Uh, that's a very high standard, right? Uh, so China is not ready for that. Uh, and I don't think that China will be eager to join TPP in the short run. Right? I, I think in the, in the future, probably uh, TPP and the China, not China, I'm sorry, it's the RCEP, for RCEP is, uh, uh, we're merged together one day, so we're going to have kind of a single uh, trade block, a trading block uh, among epic uh, country. Uh, that's uh, where possible. Anybody else in the panel wanted to address TPP? No. Okay. I have a question. I, I see a woman back there. Like, can we try? Sorry, play the female and ask her. Yeah. Don't worry. You'll, we'll get you. My name is Leni Rubinstein from the Executive Intelligence Review. It was mentioned uh, at the, on the panel that it's good that China has a debt because it has been invested in infrastructure which will be good for in the future. Uh, I, regarding the current situation, um, US and Europe has a huge debt and a number of leading economists recently has warned of a financial collapse in the uh, transatlantic area. Uh, just 10 days ago, four major Italian banks went bankrupt, 
And here by the 1st of January, there are now a policy for bail-in of the banks that are in trouble in Europe. And so the debt in Europe and the United States is not because of massive investment in infrastructure, but uh, through a gigantic leveraged bubble of financial instruments. And my question is what the panels think uh, will be the effect on China with the financial bubble crisis in the transatlantic region. Because in my view, it's not so, so much, a lot of the problems for China is uh, will there be a lack of demand uh, because of the economic financial troubles here in the transatlantic region? That's my question. Some of the external issues that yeah. you okay. guys have raised, for sure. Uh, let me give you a few comments. Uh, I think that um, too much debt is not good. The too little debt is not, uh, is n uh, is not good either. What we want is a balance between savings and, uh, uh, and the debt. Now the problem in the United States, and especially in the periphery European, I think it is not because they have too much government debt. It's because they uh, have a, a balance of payment, payment crisis. They have too much foreign debt. And uh, that's not the case in China, because uh, I just showed you that uh, China has huge net foreign assets. And uh, in terms of the financial bubble, I think that it is true. It is true that China uh, has some kind of financial bubble built in their stock market and also in the bond market in the recent two years. But I, th I think that to the, ex the extent of that financial bubble is still, I think, controllable. And, uh, and the more, more important that this financial bubble hasn't led to uh, uh, excessive buildup of the, of the, of the leverage in the, in, the, in, the, in the country. Well, if you look at the overall government debt, if you if you add the government, central government debt and local government debt together, uh, the Chinese public debt as a share of GDP is less than 80, 60%. And uh, the ratio in the United States is more than 100. And the ratio in, in a lot of the urban countries is more than 100. And the ratio in the Japan is 250. 250. So I don't think uh, China have a debt problem and uh, because the situation here, in, here and there is, is quite different. And I think, and also part of her question was, and Lu Fang, you talked about this, a lot of these advanced economies actually haven't really ever fully recovered, right? She seems to suggest what if they have yet another crisis, what will that do for demand for everything that China sells to the world? Uh, uh, actually, you, you have to distinguish uh, between Europe and this country. Yesterday we have uh, in close the door discussion with our American colleagues, the leading economies in this country think you know, now United States in uh, full employment recovery already mm -hmm. because your unemployment rate has been declined less than 5%. Can be further a little bit lower, but it has been approaching to you know, sort of the level which regarded by a lot of the economies as uh, full employment already. Mm -hmm. So in other words, in this country, even though, of course, the 2% growth rate is substantially lower than what a lot of people expected, and especially in comparison with historical levels. But uh, if you look at the other major macroeconomic indicators, you cannot say it's still in the crisis, okay? Mm -hmm. But in Europe, it's different because we have the euro debt crisis. We also have the rigid system of the euro currency. So our adjustment is not that, you know, and the flexible as, you know, a lot of people uh, think. So it's different. So generally speaking, because uh, in this country, maybe the potential growth rate has been declined, you know, from the 3% to 2%. And because in other major developing con developed countries like Japan or uh, Europe, the growth rate is uh, very sluggish. So the external environment, you know, and uh, is not very favorable for China, okay. But on the other hand, you know, China also served as an external environment for other countries because we're all in uh, one global economy. So that is the, you know, interactive relationships. So we're, we're in some boat. 
we have to coordinate the macroeconomic policy. Uh, maybe different countries, you know, look at definitely look at the issue differently. So that is challenge issue. So G20 will play uh, provide a platform for this kind of this kind of coordination. Hopefully, you know, we can do better, you know, in future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I promised I would get to you. What's probably the penultimate question? Because we're running out of time. Yeah, hi, Professor. Uh, my name is Jason Do. Actually, I graduated uh, from Peking University last year in computer science, and now I'm a graduate student at Cornell Information Science. Uh, so my question is that, like, uh, as a like a uh, young generation of uh, uh, students uh, at my position, I when we look at news and uh, like uh, people's talk inside and outside the Great War. I found it's kind of getting more and more difficult for me to identify what's the real truth, who is really the good people, and uh, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> and what's really the goodness of society, kind of. I feel like uh, it's very getting hard for me to identify what's really the value we should pursue, or uh, who is honest, who lie. Uh, it's very hard, I want to like, <laughs> as experienced e economist, like, uh, we're still in, and. Uh, so what's like the question? So my, uh, how do you make the judgment when you see different complicated? What's your, what do you think? How do you <laughs> tell if somebody's a truthful or a con man? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. You take that mic. Yeah. Well, you, 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 are going to, you are going to know this uh, as you become older, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, experience <laughs> right there. It's a good question, don't get me wrong. I just... To answer it, it will take a lifetime. <laughs> um, I'm T.K. Chang, a lawyer with uh, Zhonglen Law Firm, one of the top law firms in China. Um, China is in the midst of a two, three year unprecedented anti-corruption uh, uh, movement in which some of the most well-known CEOs uh, of the most well-known companies, including some of the companies previously mentioned, have been uh, suddenly disappeared or their cell phones and not answering. Now, corruption is a matter of definition. Some people say America is very corrupt, but we do it, quote, legally through lawyers. But <laughs> so is one of the, do any one of you think that one of the unspoken reasons, because it's unspoken, because who could be for corruption? Unspoken reasons for the slowdown is this, this what's been happening? You're, the core of the question is, is the crackdown on corruption one of the reasons why we're seeing a slowdown in the Chinese economy? Correct. Uh, yeah, to some extent. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's the, the slowing down of the government spending that definitely has, uh, has a lot to do with anti-corruption drive. Uh, you know, we, we also feel that uh, we are kind of uh, uh, also part of the government, right? Because we use government money, right? Uh, so we are subject uh, to the regulation uh, put by the government. But I, but I think uh, this probably is a short-term phenomenon. Okay? Uh, regulations on spending is it, good. It, it's also kind of a protection uh, for us. Uh, there, there were guys, professors, uh, who moved the, their research money to their personal account, and they just uh, consume out of those accounts. Uh, that's a criminal. Uh, charges uh, in this country, pro, right? Definitely. Uh, so uh, we need to change that system. Uh, but uh, uh, in order to change the system, uh, sometimes you have to use the heavy hands. And now we see the, that heavy hand in China. Anybody else want to weigh in? Do you agree that the trade off is worth it, the crackdown on corruption, uh, if indeed it's leading to a slowdown? And is that an okay thing considering what it's achieving? supposed to be achieving. No? Okay, no takers. <laughs> um, so we are at the end of our time. Uh, it's been great. I'm sure the panelists are going to stick around if you have further questions. Coffee break. I don't know, Steve, do you want to say anything before we go to coffee break? Or? Thank you for it was a pleasure to be Thank here. You. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Indeed.